thinking better and thinking together about life's most important issues. A place to finally meet in the middle, to think freely and reasonably about the big questions of life. This is Thinker Sensitive. Welcome to Thinker Sensitive. My name is Ryan Ragazine, and I am honored to be your host. The month of August is almost finished, and the month of September is almost upon us. Today, we are continuing our discussion on American poverty. Last week, we looked at the key definitions and standards that are often used when assessing poverty in the United States and in other places throughout the globe. In this week's episode, we're going to take a look at the popular debate surrounding the nature and status of poverty in the U.S. This is a debate that, unfortunately, tends to be very political and ideological. Partisanship and bias play a huge role in this conversation, which is something that we need to understand when engaging with the relevant media and content related to this issue. In short, this is a topic that gets politicized rather quickly. As always, I'll try my best to be as balanced as possible, invoking sources and claims from both sides of the spectrum. I do have a personal opinion on this issue, though, one that will always be subjective by nature of my humanity, a nature that is both finite and fallible. So please use this episode to think through the issue for yourself and to form your own conclusions. Philip Alston a representative for the United Nations on issues of poverty and human rights, put out a report a few years ago stating that in the United States, quote, about 40 million people live in poverty, 18.5 million in extreme poverty, and 5.3 million live in third world conditions of absolute poverty, end quote. The Heritage Foundation, a right-wing conservative organization, criticized Alston's statement claiming the use of faulty data and insufficient standards. They argue that families that Alston considers to be in extreme poverty, quote, typically have air conditioning, computers, DVD players, and cell phones. They rarely report material hardships such as hunger, eviction, or having utilities cut off, end quote. Several years ago, Princeton sociologist Catherine Eden and University of Michigan social policy researcher Luke Schaefer published a paper. This paper was based on survey data, claiming that an alarming amount of American children live in households earning less than $2 in cash income per person. Eden and Schaefer later turned their paper into a critically acclaimed book. The book was entitled $2 a Day, Living on Almost Nothing in America. In a New York Times review, the popular sociologist William Julius Wilson called it, quote, essential and a, quote, call to action. Their work inspired add-on research by Nobel Prize-winning economist Angus Deaton. Bernie Sanders even quoted them on the campaign trail. A 2019 article by Dylan Matthews from Vox, a liberal-leaning news outlet, sums up the scholarly rebuttal to Eden and Schaefer's claim. Here's an excerpt. Quote, But since their research started circulating, some economists and sociologists have pushed back, arguing that Eden and Schaefer's research, which relied on surveys, underestimated the support 
very poor households get from welfare programs that provide benefits in kind rather than through cash. That's because many people frequently fail to tell surveyors about government programs they benefit from, meaning surveys can underreport assistance. The Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, formerly food stamps in particular, is a crucial support for many of these families and would place most above the $2 a day line if respondents included them in their responses to surveys. The most comprehensive response to date by University of Chicago professor Bruce Meyer, his colleagues Derek Wu and Victoria Moors, and the Census Bureau's Carla Medaglia has just been publicly released and concludes that true $2 a day poverty, after adjusting the data properly, is extremely rare. Our best estimate of the extreme poverty rate, they write, is 0.11% for individuals as of 2011. That implies that about 336,160 people are in extremely poor households, far lower than the couple million children estimated by Eden and Schaefer. The vast majority of those people, they argue, are childless adults, and the extreme poverty rate for parents is close to zero. Because they used private IRS, Social Security, and other government data, Meyer and his colleagues have more precise estimates of what income people are earning and what benefits they're collecting than surveys can provide. That gives their estimates a great deal of credibility. End quote. I mentioned the Nobel Prize winning economist Angus Deaton. A few years ago, the New York Times, a left leaning news outlet, published an opinion piece by Deaton in which he claimed that millions of Americans are, quote, as destitute as the world's poorest people. End quote. Another article from Vox, this time from Ryan Briggs in 2018, provides a detailed response to Deaton's claim. Briggs states, quote, This is simply wrong. To the extent that this empirical claim by an esteemed Princeton scholar leads policymakers to reduce international aid, or causes charitable donors to redirect their money away from the world's most impoverished people, it is also dangerous. It is incorrect and misleading to draw an equivalence between poverty in America and poverty in low-income countries. It is only through the misinterpretation of poverty statistics that one can equate the two. Let's start with the purely economic side of poverty. In order to measure poverty, we need to survey people and record how much they earn. There are two main ways of doing this. The first, common in low-income countries, is to ask people about their consumption and then derive a dollar figure from their answers. The second approach, more common in high-income countries, is to simply ask people about their income. There are many problems in comparing data across these different types of surveys. The largest is that poor people in rich countries often receive many non-cash benefits that boost consumption without boosting income. In one analysis, The non-cash benefits provided to American households with near zero income increase their household consumption by an average of about $20 a day. A very well-regarded book on the analysis of household surveys notes that survey-based measures of income are often substantially less than survey-based measures of consumption. 
even in industrialized countries. The World Bank, which runs many of these surveys, has noted the dangers in comparing income and consumption based poverty figures. In one report, its experts observe that many of the people who declare zero income on a survey have a consumption level that is not zero. End quote. Briggs claims that Deaton makes the same error that Eden and Schaefer made. He explains further that, quote, his American poverty figures measure income, but the poverty figures for poor countries measure consumption. Citing the Oxford economist Robert Allen, Deaton also argues that the extreme poverty line for Americans should be higher than $2 a day, perhaps even as high as $4 a day, because there are necessities of life in rich, cold, urban, and individualistic countries that are less needed in poor countries. For instance, people in warm countries may not need housing, he says, and a poor agricultural laborer in the tropics can get by with little clothing and transportation. These are debatable claims, and Allen's work on the subject has come under a lot of scrutiny. But even if we grant a higher $4 a day poverty line for Americans, but use apples to apples consumption based poverty measures, then it turns out that America still has only a tiny fraction of its population in extreme poverty. The fact that anyone in the U.S. lives on less than $4 a day is a genuine tragedy. But Deaton's count of 3 million to 5 million Americans in extreme poverty is off by an order of magnitude. End quote. Briggs concludes his article with these words, quote, The very act of living in America provides many benefits that are not generally captured in poverty measures, but that enable one to live a better life. America is not experiencing civil war. The American political system is highly imperfect and under stress but it is considerably better at protecting liberties, providing services, and enabling representation than the political systems in many low-income countries. These often intangible benefits help people lead fuller lives, even if they are often not considered when discussing poverty, and they overwhelmingly lean in America's favor. In sum, America indeed has very serious problems with poverty and inequality. But it is wildly inaccurate to claim that millions of Americans are as destitute as the world's poorest people. End quote. In the summer of 2019, the New York Times released a video op ed that lamented, quote, fake news and called for, quote, a more truthful approach to, quote, the myth of America as the greatest nation on earth, end quote. They claim the U.S. has fallen well behind Europe in many areas and has, quote, more in common with developing countries than we'd like to admit, end quote. Producers from the Times cite how the U.S. ranks in the OECD, a group of 36 predominantly wealthy Western and Democratic countries, concluding that America is the richest country in the OECD, but that we're also the poorest, with a whopping 18% poverty rate. This perspective is in line with a recent article from confrontingpoverty.org. Let me read you some excerpts. Quote, The myth that the poor in the United States are not so bad off can be found in a wide range of places, 
It basically reflects the idea that those in poverty have nothing to complain about. That given the conditions in less developed countries, things could be much worse. Most analysts would argue that the more relevant comparison would be the group of other high economy countries, such as those found in the European Union, Canada, Japan, Australia, and so on. In comparing poverty in the U.S. to these OECD countries, we find that American poverty is both more prevalent and more extreme. What we find is that the U.S. rates of poverty are substantially higher and more extreme than those found in the other 25 nations. The overall U.S. rate using this measure stands at 17.8% compared to the 25-country average of 10.7%. The Scandinavian and Benelux countries tend to have the lowest rates of poverty. For example, the overall rate of poverty in Denmark is only 5.5%. To summarize, when analyzing poverty as the number of persons who fall below 50% of a country's median income, we find that the United States has far and away the highest overall poverty rate in this group of 26 developed nations. Furthermore, the distance of the poor from the overall median income is extreme in the U.S. At the same time, the United States is arguably the wealthiest nation in the world. End quote. A 2019 article from Just Facts, a center-to-right-center media outlet, supplies a rebuttal to the New York Times op-ed claim. Let me read a sizable portion. Quote, The assertion from the New York Times op-ed prompted Just Facts to conduct a rigorous, original study of this issue with data from the OECD the World Bank, and the U.S. government's Bureau of Economic Analysis. It found that the Times is not merely wrong about this issue, but is reporting the polar opposite of reality. The most glaring evidence against the Times rhetoric is a note located just above the OECD's data for poverty rates. It explains that these rates measure relative poverty within nations, not between nations. As the note states, the figures represent portions of people with less than half the median household income in their own nations, and thus, two countries with the same poverty rates may differ in terms of the relative income level of the poor. The upshot is laid bare by the fact that this OECD measure assigns a higher poverty rate to the U.S., 17.8%, than to Mexico, 16.6%. Yet, World Bank data shows that 35% of Mexico's population lives on less than $5.50 per day as compared to only 2% of people in the United States. A groundbreaking study by Just Facts has discovered that after accounting for all income, charity, and non-cash welfare benefits, like subsidized housing and food stamps, the poorest 20% of Americans consume more goods and services than the national averages for all people in most affluent countries. This includes the majority of countries in the prestigious Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, including its European members. In other words, if the U.S. poor were a nation, it would be one of the world's richest. Notably, this study was reviewed by Dr. Henrik Schneider, professor of economics 
at Nordakademi University in Germany and the chief economist of the Swiss Federation of Small and Medium-Sized Enterprises. After examining the source data and just facts methodology, he concluded, quote, This study is sound and conforms with academic standards. I personally think it provides valuable insight into poverty measures and adds considerably to this field of research. End quote. The Just Facts article continues, quote, The World Bank's preferred indicator of material well-being is consumption of goods and services. This is due to practical reasons of reliability, and because consumption is thought to better capture long-run welfare levels than current income. Likewise, a 2003 paper in the Journal of Human Resources explains that research on poor households in the U.S. suggests that consumption is better reported than income and is a more direct measure of material well-being. Consumption standards were behind the original setting of the poverty line, but governments now use income because of its ease of reporting. The World Bank publishes a comprehensive data set on consumption that isn't dependent on the accuracy of household surveys and includes all goods and services, but it only provides the average consumption per person in each nation, not the poorest people in each nation. However, The U.S. Bureau of Economic Analysis published a study that provides exactly that for 2010. Combined with World Bank data for the same year, these data sets show that the poorest 20% of U.S. households have higher average consumption per person than the averages for all people in most nations of the OECD and Europe. The fact remains that the privilege of living in the U.S. affords poor people with more material resources than the averages for most of the world's richest nations. In light of these facts, the Times claim that the U.S. has more in common with developing countries than we'd like to admit is especially far-fetched. In 2010, even the poorest 20% of Americans consumed 3 to 30 times more goods and services than the averages for all people in a wide array of developing nations around the world. These immense gaps in standards of living are a major reason why people from developing nations immigrate to the U.S., instead of vice versa, end quote. To close out today's podcast, I want to read a couple statements from a 2018 Washington Post article written by a PhD candidate in political science at Yale University. This will provide a good segue to my personal evaluation in the next episode, the final installment of a three-part set on American poverty. The article is concerned with the diminishing interest in foreign aid, which is also a personal concern of mine. The author writes, quote, Even the developed world's poor and middle classes are by global standards extraordinarily rich. After adjusting for cost of living differences, a typical American still earns an income that is 10 times the income received by the typical person in the world. Do Americans understand this fact? In short, no. Does their misperception of their comparative affluence help to explain deep-seated opposition to foreign aid and other forms of international redistribution? In short, Yes. End quote. The author later writes, quote, 
Americans typically place themselves in the top 37% of the world's income distribution. However, the vast majority of U.S. residents rank comfortably in the top 10%. End quote. We'll be back with the final segment next week. Until then, take care. This episode and all episodes of Thinker Sensitive are available on thinkersensitive.com, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and more. Subscribe on your favorite podcast app today to listen to more thought-provoking content from Thinker Sensitive.